All right, thank you everybody for being here. Um, thank you everybody for being here in person. And we also have some people joining us on Zoom. Uh, just to let you all know, this will be recorded. Can you guys hear me okay on Zoom? Can somebody give us a thumbs up? Okay, perfect. All right, well, my name is Amelia Kelscher and I am a Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota board member and also a special education teacher for the Rochester Public School District. I work with students with learning disabilities, emotional behavioral disorders, and autism spectrum disorder. One of my passions is ensuring that all children, regardless of their background or ability level, learn how to read. I was thrilled when the READ Act passed because I understand the impact that this piece of legislation will have on students across our state. Before I introduce the panel, I want to welcome you to a discussion of the READ Act, a monumental piece of legislation in our state that passed last session. Did you know that the READ Act stands for Reading to Ensure Academic Development? There are many people to thank for the passage of this bill, many people who are in this room, and many more who are at rallies, legislator meetings, and hearings over the past 10 years. We will do a brief summary of the key elements of the READ Act in a minute, but first I want to introduce you to our panel. Sarah Carlson Walrath is going to lead our panel discussion. Sarah is co-chair of the newly formed Reading League of Minnesota, she has served as a board member for the IDA Upper Midwest Branch and works part-time for the Reading Center in Rochester. As an attorney and former legislative staffer, Sarah has a passion for ensuring regular people access the legislative process and work toward a more equitable education system that includes access for all students to evidence-based reading instruction. The next panelists all played a key role in the passage of the READ Act, the most important being Representative Heather Edelson. Representative Edelson is the current state representative for District 50A, which includes Edina and parts of Bloomington. She is vice chair of the Ways and Needs Committee and serves on Education Finance, Health and Human Services Policy, and Environment and Natural Resources Committees. Representative Edelson is a mom, a dyslexic, and a champion for literacy and for those whom our systems are leaving behind. Representative Edelson was the chief author of the READ Act and was instrumental in getting it through the legislative process oh. last session. She is retiring at the end of next legislative se session, and we will miss her voice at the Capitol. Our next two panelists represent two organizations that are already playing a key role in implementing the READ Act and will continue to do so over the next two years. We have representatives from Cary and the Minnesota Department of Education. Dr. Kim Gibbons is the director of the Center for Applied Research and Education Improvement, also known as CARI, at the Minnesota, at the University of Minnesota, and the co-director of the Wisconsin Minnesota Comprehensive Center. Her research and professional interests include the multi-tier system of support framework, or MTSS, the science of reading, educational policy and leadership, improve, improvement science, and evidence-based teaching practices. Dr. Gibbons obtained her PhD in school psychology from the University of Oregon. Dr. Gibbons has worked as director of special education, staff development coordinator, and a school psychologist. In addition, she has been on the faculty at the University of Minnesota as an instructor in the school psychology program. She is active in state leadership and is the past president of the Minnesota Association of Special Educators. Finally, she is the co-author of four books and has numerous other peer-reviewed publications. Bobby Burnham is Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Teaching and Learning at the Minnesota Department of Education. Bobby oversees divisions of early learning services, academic standards, instruction and assessment, and libraries and out-of-school time at the Minnesota Department of Education. Bobby started her career as a kindergarten teacher and worked with the Minnesota Center for Reading Research for eight years as a Reading First Coordinator. Bobby holds a master's degree in literacy education and a K-12 reading specialist licensure. Bobby's skills and expertise focus on leveraging connections among early care and education programs and the implementation of equitable, innovative learning strategies that are evidence-based and proven to be impactful on student learning. And now I will hand it over to Sarah. Thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. Um, if you're here in person, there is a one, or I guess we'll call it a two-page it's very hard to summarize this bill, Representative Ellison. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, it's a long, it's a long bill. We're not going to slog through all of it, but just high level, I'm going to just talk for two minutes about what's in the Read Act, and then we're going to talk about some of those details with these panelists who are amazing and know um, a bunch about the Read Act and how we're going to implement it. So the Read Act replaces Read Well by Third Grade. That's our old legislation. This is now all brand new. 
Um, and Amelia did a great job of talking about some of the acronyms, but MDE, when we say that, or when you see that on sheets, that's the Minnesota Department of Education. And CARI is something that I didn't know about until a couple of years ago, but CARI stands for the Center for Applied Research and Educational Improvement at the University of Minnesota. So that's CARI when we say that, CARI and MDE. So high level, what kinds of things are we gonna talk about here? We kind of broke it down into five sections, but high level, we're gonna talk about universal screening. So by next school year, not this school year, next school year, districts must adopt and administer an evidence-based reading screener from a list that MDE has already put up on their website to all students in grades K to three within the first six weeks and the last six weeks of the school year. Those two approved screeners are Dibbles and Fastbridge. Um, those were chosen and we can get into that too. Somebody has a question about that, um, but that doesn't replace the dyslexia screening that was in statute, it goes together with those things. We still have a dyslexia screening requirement and now we have an additional universal screening requirement. So that's the screening. Okay, so purchase, use and purchase of evidence-based literacy curriculum. So it hasn't been released yet, but I'm sure somebody <laughs> will wanna know, but I bet they would say um, January 1st, 2024, MDE and CARI will identify at least five evidence-based literacy curriculum for grades K to three. Um, and starting now, when districts are purchasing curriculum, they need to purchase an evidence-based curriculum, though not necessarily from that list. So if that's not confusing enough, we'll talk about that <laughs> and what that means a little bit later. Um, educational professional development requirements. So in August, MDE and CARI identified three state-funded professional development programs that focus on the five pillars of literacy. Those are CARI, CORE, and LETTERS. So those are the three. Um, and beginning in July of this, you know, after the end of the school year, that's when um, educators will have to start taking that professional development training. Then we have last section, data. Lots of data is going to be coming into the Department of Education from districts, screening data, curriculum data, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. That's a lot of stuff. Um, that isn't even everything that the bill accomplished and did, um, but those are some of the things that we're gonna talk about tonight. So before we get really started, um, we introduce them for you. Um, but I do want to give them an opportunity to just briefly share what they hope the READ Act means for students and educators in Minnesota. Before we really get into the details, I'd, I'd love for them to share. We're going to start with Representative Edelson. I was going to say me first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, good. Um, Why the READ Act? What do you do? That's great. Okay, I just want to clarify too. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, this is like you said it and then I was yeah. like, mm, hold on, that's not quick. So for the dyslexia screener, actually the screener that we do, it will actually serve the same purpose. It won't have to be two different screens. Right. So I just want to make sure that, that it's, yeah. so otherwise that's going to look like we're screening kids mm -hmm. like nonstop. And we don't want to do that because I'm not, you know, I don't think anybody here wants that. And I want to make sure that that's clear that we're not going to be doing that. One screener. Um, okay, so um, uh, Heather Edelson, I come from this issue as a mom. When I was first elected, I got to the legislature and I don't know, have you guys all been to the Capitol? Raise your hands, raise your hands online, raise your hands. Okay, um, so when I first got to the Capitol, I was like, who here is working on literacy? And I was like hunting people down, like very serious because I had just found out, and that was years ago actually, um, that my twins had dyslexia. And um, do any, we have parents here that have kids that have dyslexia or they themselves have, okay, good. So what you know is you're like, you just want to try to solve the problems for your kids, right? And, but I remember when I went in um, as a mom and I, I, we paid for the screener, the screener was very expensive. Um, and growing up to a single mom, I was like, okay, you no, know, my, if, if this screener even, or if these evals even existed back then, my mom, single mom couldn't afford it. She worked a factory job, was the first one to go to college in my family. And then, um, so not only was I like, okay, we have to fix this because this is a problem here. But then they said, when I, when we we're doing the evaluation of our kids, they said, did you or your husband have trouble learning to read? And I remember feeling like really blamed. And uh, I'm a therapist myself. 
And so we, 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 you know, we, you say, hey, everybody have better bend of therapy. You don't have to raise your hands. It's okay. <laughs> I, 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 I go often. I, I mean, so, so it's, so I was like, hold on, this is like, this is like autism or other things. Right. But I didn't think about it that way. I felt, I left feeling like really blamed and shamed. And so as parents, I just want to say, you're not alone. I hear you. We are trying to embed love into this bill because, and that's hopefully what we can talk about. I know there's a lot of logistics tonight, but, you know, giving each other grace around literacy is really important. Um, so just making sure that while we're talking about all the logistics, know that the people up here love and care about kids and families that are struggling. Um, and it's not just kids with dyslexia. It's kids that don't have dyslexia. They don't have the characteristics, but they need help too. And so um, we tried to look at the Read Act. So there was multiple different things. We had a divided legislature and I'm gonna stop talking because I will tell you the whole, but we I came from a divided legislature for four years. And then we got this amazing thing called the trifecta. And I was like, oh my gosh. I called Bobby. I was like, oh, I know it's not full literacy, but like, let's, let, we're going to shake this up. There's a good story to tell you about how Bobby and I called full literacy in the Read Act. I was like, Bobby, because we had some, we had some moments. It was like, I was like, Bobby, it's like we're in a relationship right now and it's, it's a little rocky, but I think we're going to get engaged and we're going to get married and they will fall in love and have a long, happy life. But um, so I just want to say it came from this idea of, we had this, we were struggling on what to do here when we had a divided legislature. And then we had this moment of like, we can do a lot and let's go big. And and I, we did, so I'll end there. I have come from here. If you can just say your name before you speak the first few times so they get used to who's who. And that was Heather Edelson. I'm the long-winded one. Politician, <laughs> elected, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm, good, good evening, everyone. I'm Kim Gibbons. Um, I am starting my 28th year in education, and when I started in Minnesota in uh, 1995, working for a group of six school districts uh, north of Minneapolis-St. Paul, it was right around the time when the Minnesota basic skills tests um, were given, and it was given to, I can't remember if it was sixth graders or eighth grade, maybe eighth graders, and uh, we only had about 20% um, of our student population across six districts per vision. It's about 11,000 kids and only 20% were proficient on a basic skills proficiency test. So I spent 20 years there and in following that kind of shocker uh, published in the Star Tribune about all the kids that couldn't read, um, we basically implemented what's in the READ Act. We provided professional learning, very comprehensive um, professional learning on what we now call the science of reading. Science of reading isn't a new thing. It, it just refers to an accumulation of research evidence that's been compiled over the past three decades about how kids learn to read and what happens when they don't and how do we make sure that all kids can be proficient? So we did professional learning, we had assessments. I came from the University of Oregon when Dibbles were being developed, the dynamic indicators of basic early literacy skills. We chose a different assessment system, um, at that time, Ames Web, and um, did universal screening three times a year, progress monitoring. We didn't have ELA standards yet. Um, so we looked at the six curriculum that the six school districts were using and tried to align it to the national reading panel. So looking at phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, comprehension, vocabulary, found out that most of the curricula that were used in kindergarten, first, second grade had zero phonemic awareness, very little phonics. Teachers were reading blocks were about 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Now we know from research, 90 to 120 minutes. But we did all of these things um, within what we now call an MTSS framework. And it didn't happen overnight, but we saw um, huge amounts of growth for all kids. We using our screening measures, we got close to 80% of kids proficient at elementary levels. Um, and we in 1995, over-identified students as learning disabilities, and we cut that number in half over seven or eight years. So I'm excited about the READ Act because 
I've lived through this before. I know it can be done. I know it's not easy. Doing the right thing isn't always easy. It takes a lot of perseverance. And I just think about the 500,000 kids right now in our state that aren't proficient readers. And um, and we can do so much better. And so, so grateful to Representative Edelson for putting this bill forward. Uh, Bobby and I have spent, I don't know how many years now, four years, five years working on building out an MTSS framework. So it's all coming together and the kids are who will benefit. Um, and the teachers also, um, I just feel so strongly about what's been put into the READ Act because teachers need, they need the training and they need support. It's not as easy as um, going through letters or another training you then have to go back to a district and apply that with the curriculum that's in place. So I, I think uh, Representative Edelson was brilliant in how she put all of the right pieces together and um, the kids uh, will thank you for that. My own kids, maybe? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> they thank me for nothing. <laughs> okay, Bobby, you're up. Okay. Hey. Bobby Burnham, Department of Ed. And I think for me, it, it's a couple different things. Um, I started in a, this leadership position at MDE two weeks before COVID hit. So it was one urgent thing after another for first three years. And what I saw there was um, just a, a need prior to my becoming an AC, I was in in early morning services and I just I was in director of early learning services and I felt that as a state we could be doing so much more for pre-k through third grade kids in the area of literacy I mean our state data speaks for itself we've got to do something I mean the MCA data the the, it was just in a place where being in a leadership position like I was, we could not, we couldn't keep doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So the other piece to this equation for me was being, I'm entering my 38th, 39th year in education. I started as a kindergarten teacher in rural Nebraska and I remember walking into that building and the teacher I was replacing was retiring. And she had walked into the room, she had three stacks of phonics workbooks. I said, oh, I'm not gonna use those. I don't, I don't, I'm using balanced literacy. I'm using whole language. That was back in the early eighties. So it took me that long. I taught 15 years, went to the U of M and still at the U of M in our reading first years, we were still promoting balanced literacy and the whole language. It just, I didn't know better. I know better now. Mm -hmm. I mean, the work that we've done with Carrie, the last three years, the last session over the years, it's just, there's no other option but to do what the READ Act has in it right now. And working with Representative Ellison was a pleasure and a delight and to be a partner and to be um, part of that process, that development and that stakeholder engagement and the listening that we did. It's a it's a monumental piece of legislation. And as I ride off into the, the sunset, hopefully <laughs> not this, anytime soon. this thing will get <laughs> implemented. And you know, it's gonna take time to turn our data around. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the states like Mississippi, Ohio, Tennessee, you know, they had really strong progress, but it took, I mean, I think Mississippi started in 1998 and in two, 2022, they finally saw maybe a 20, 25% increase in their literacy rates. And Mississippi hit it hard. We're hitting it hard. And with just the excitement that we have experience with the teachers who took letters training from our $3 million allocation two sessions ago, it's phenomenal. I mean, they are excited and letters is no small task. So I'm excited to, to move forward, to get 
the pieces of the READ Act implemented, but also want to maintain a sense of reality where, you know, this this is our silver bullet, but the silver bullet's going to take three to four years before we start seeing some really realistic good data. I don't know if Kim would disagree with that, but going to jump in. Okay. Yeah, yeah Sarah. Okay. So I I appreciate you all introducing that and setting this up because I think it does show the evolution that has taken place in people who end up in really important positions for our state and can help lead us forward as we implement really solid legislation. Um, so what you just said at the end of that, Bobby, is I think you know many people sitting in this room have students in the in the education system right now. And it is hard to hear that what we're talking about isn't happening and changing tomorrow. It doesn't change tomorrow. It's going to take a while to get there. But let's talk about, I think, it is inspirational to talk about change expectations, right? Because when you know you, you start in a district and you have a 20% proficiency in your district, or in our state, we have a 50% proficiency in our state, let's talk about changed expectations and how we can get more believers out there that it is possible and that it's, the work is worth doing. So I'm gonna read something that was in a newspaper and I'm not gonna call out this particular superintendent, but I'm gonna just frame what was stated because I think that's, you know, you this is the choir, right? Everyone in here is the choir. And so how do we move more people forward? And I just wanna hear you say what you think the READ Act contributes to how we might move this particular superintendent because it's not alone. I should have said he. Yes. <laughs> that covers a, a okay. lot of them. We need more women right. superintendents. So, right. So this superintendent was quoted in the newspaper as saying the following. That, so knowing that the Read Act is looking for all kids, right? All is all. The superintendent is quoted as saying, our district's goal of 80% is more realistic considering the challenges facing some students who have learning disabilities or those who come from backgrounds where English is not their first language. Okay. Can you, one of you, talk through what the READ Act requires of districts in terms of where they need to set their expectations for literacy? Well, the READ Act is very clear that all, all kids, all kids should be able to be having given that right and the belief to that they can read. And so at every single grade. And so if that child's not testing at grade level in fifth grade, they'll still get interventions and screeners. And the READ Act should hopefully make it easier for families to get the help that, that, that their child needs. Um, because before it was like, we were waiting for kids to fail, right? Oh, there you, there's your 504. Well, listen, I have two kids with an IEP. It is it is no, you know, 504 is, is it's different. It's different. And people will be like, man, I got that IEP. So um, I, I think you're never gonna, you're always gonna have people like him. Um, I will say when I started working on policy, people, I remember a conversation I had, they were like, oh yeah, dyslexia, right, sure. And I was like, well, what is this? Is there a fly by you? <laughs> and they were like, what? And I was like, well, what was this thing? And he's like, well, you know, the, those parents, they're really organized. And I was like, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, I was like, well, it's really good to meet you. I'm Heather Edelson. I have dyslexia. And you know what's amazing? I have two kids that have it too. And so I think that we we stop, we it's we confront it. It's just like bullying. It's dismissive. It is unacceptable. And we call it, we see something, you say something. Okay. That's we're gonna leave that as the answer. Okay, right? All right. Well, that's the answer we want. Yeah, right? okay. All right. put out there. Um, okay, so as we go, we're gonna do this fast because there's a lot to cover and we're gonna kind of move through and talk about a couple of things, right? We just talked about expectations for learning, and I have one more follow-up question on that, just as I am reading. Um, we're talking about screening, student interventions when they are not reading at grade level, teacher professional development, and then curriculum. We're going to slog through all that, okay? So as when we say all kids, there's a couple of, we have, we have questions that we've consolidated from lots of different spaces. So I'm going to try my best to anticipate what people might ask at the end. So all kids, when we say all kids, do we mean all kids? Do we mean kids receiving special education services and students who are multilingual learners. Do we mean those kids too? Yes. Look, yes. At, the, look at the nodding. <laughs> Former special okay. ed director. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
And to what degree, and, and maybe one of you can take this, and this might be a one word answer, I don't know. Definitely um, don't get me that. <laughs> does, the, does, the, does anything in the READ Act impact students and teachers who may be um, in a private school? No. no, no, this is public school. See? I mean, we hope See, that- uh, We wish, we wish, we, we want to. We hope that they are aware of yeah. and yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I've had private schools reach out to me because they're interested, oh, okay. right? Like, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. Doesn't okay. impact parochial schools either. I mean, I know that they're yeah. semi. Right. Okay. That was nice. Okay. Screening. Let's move to screening. Um, Representative Ellison did clarify this a little bit, but there's a couple things I think there's some nuanced things that we want to cover. So two universal screeners were chosen for grades one to three, and I stated those as fast bridge and endables. Question one, and maybe this is just super fast. Do, do districts have to use one of those two screeners? Yes. Yes. Districts have to use one of those. It, two it feels like, does it feel like trivia night to you? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, we're going to each have a bunch of <laughs> um, And Representative Allison, maybe you, you, you did speak to this, but I'm just going to put it out there anyway. Does this new universal screening requirement? Um, change the requirement that we already put into state law for finding kids who may demonstrate care. It incorporates it in with it. it. So, right. it, you know, yeah, yeah. Dr. Gibbons can speak to exactly how that would look, but yes, we, we tried to, you know, I think there would be like an additional question or something. You will have, I think I read, right, between the two organizations, between Carrie and MDE, there'll be additional guidance on how schools may use that data team to the hell. Yes, and right. that should be coming out soon. Yes. yes. Okay, soon. <laughs> soon. Okay. Um, here is a this is a this is a nuanced question, but it's one that I've heard um, people ask in addition to me. When you're screening students, right? So we said we're gonna start screening students in the first six weeks and the last six weeks of the year. Who determines what criteria is used to say whether a kid is at grade level or not? This is the yeah. Do you yeah. Want to, We're all looking yeah. at it. yes. I mean, I so the first time that the districts are going to be reporting the data is a year from the summer, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. And so for school year, what, yes. One of the things that we know that we can do is all both Dibbles and Fastbridge make comparisons to what how kids are performing nationally. But there's, when I was at the St. Croix River Education District, we actually had enough longitudinal data that we could, we found that the measures that are in both Dibbles and Fastbridge can actually predict performance on the third grade MCA and above starting in kindergarten. And so I think one of the things ahead in the next six months or so ago, uh, coming out is that we're gonna have to decide what those thresholds are going to be uh, in Minnesota, um, especially in grades where there's not an MCA for grades K1 and two. Um, I suppose one could say that if you're proficient on the MCA third grade and above that you're at grade level. Um, but those are the things that we're gonna be talking about mm -hmm. is what is that, that threshold going to look like. So both Fastbridge and um, Dibbles currently use the 40th percentile, that you have to be at the 40th percentile or above nationally to be considered low risk. But we also know that that's probably a little bit too low in terms of our MCAs. You have to be closer to the 60th percentile in reading to be proficient. So mm -hmm. that's a to be determined, but we have a little bit of time to so well, you MDE and Carrie set that bar so it's consistent across all districts. Is that the goal? We're gonna have to talk about how to do that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's We've been cool. kind of focused on identifying professional learning yes. right now and, yes. and curriculum. <laughs> yeah, the great the curriculum. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we had a few things going on. Okay. Um, you guys. Are Perfect. Okay, so the READ Act is going to generate a lot of data that's supposed to be reported by districts coming to the Minnesota Department of Education. So maybe this is more of you to talk about this for a little bit, um, Bobby. But can you talk a little bit about, and I think this will come in the end of the 24th school year. So the 24th, so not this school year, next school year, 24-25, districts will be reporting data. What kind, so this would be a two-part question. What kinds of data will districts be reporting? 
And is that going to be in a digestible, is it going to be in a PDF that everyone has to read all the district's data to find out these things? Or is there a way for, for people in the public to know what, what scores are coming from districts and what curriculums they're using in a easier way? Well, that's a multi-pronged question. I know, it's two parts, yeah. So in the past, MDE has not had a very systematic or um, smooth way to collect read well by third grade data from districts. I mean, basically they submitted us a spreadsheet. Dr. Amy Schulting, our dyslexia specialist sitting there in the pink sweater would have to <laughs> look at all these different spreadsheets. So we are um, working, in fact, tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, we are working with our IT department to uh, develop a data collection system that not only eases the collect the reporting from districts to MDE, but allows MDE to analyze the data to help districts turn around and inform their practices and instructions. So the data collection will be part of the local literacy plan submission. So the first local literacy plan is due to be submitted June of 2024. And so that template is going to be an online template that districts submit with all the required components that are outlined in the READ Act that um, we need to know um, from districts how they're implementing certain pieces of the READ Act. So that's our data collection piece, not only on the student side, but also the programmatic side and the implementation side. So we are going to have much better data eventually um, than we've ever had on students and districts and their local literacy plans. So that's exciting. It's just getting that system in place and developed. So in June of 25 is the first time that districts will be submitting their universal screening data. What we hope to do and is not um, set or finalized yet is to work with each of the vendors and have agreements with them for them to submit the data from districts instead of having individual districts submit to MDE. So it just really streamlines and kind of makes it much easier on everyone. A couple other things, we've, um, we'll have a new literacy data analyst to help us look and analyze all this important data we're getting to help inform our further at the state level policies and practices. Um, what, did, what else have I missed there? No, that's really- The aggregation okay. of data. And yeah. so you asked about oh, that. Yeah. yeah. So the public facing piece is mm -hmm. yet to be determined. Okay. I mean, we know that we're going to get a ton of good data and people are going to want to know what that data is. So of course we have reports. In the read yeah. actually, we, we clarify, and there's a thousand parts to this. Yeah. And by the way, Bobby and I, the read the the technology piece, Bobby's like, we need money for that. And we were on the phone at the, like the last, we were like, <laughs> and the, the, the bill's getting put together. And I was like, how much money do you need? Bobby and she is like I need like you know I'm like running I'm pulling up they're like all right each one's gonna make this much and we're like anyways it's really it how laws are made are funny but there will be aggregation of data just like MCAs um to kind of look at I mean that's going to be in the the, comp the compiled report to the legislature which everybody will be able to have access because that's public but it will show like what kids what schools and you'll be able to see all of that and that's in 2025 right is it February. Now I can't remember that. I mean, ideally, you'd want this data to be part of the <clears throat> school report card. I mean, because it's important data, and you know, communities want to know what their school district's doing for their local literacy plan, and as well as how their students are doing because of the implementation of it. So, yeah, I do have a follow-up question about that. So, once upon a time, to those who have you know, we were first paying attention to screening data for characteristics of dyslexia. Again, we're not calling out any districts when I'm saying this. But some districts reported having zero students um, <laughs> having characteristics. It's typically impossible, right? So we're going to open it's all. It's always clear that that's completely impossible. But what that brings up, though, is that you know there are districts who need help mm -hmm. um, deciphering what that data is. And is that to anyone here? Is that a is that a portion of what the Read Act is trying to address? You're using that data, and you're like, uh oh, looks like this district could use something. 
Absolutely. Yeah. It's also part of the MTSS yeah, two, system. Two worlds are yeah. colliding. The That's READ right. Act has literacy specialists. The yeah. university is developing a coaching curriculum for the literacy specialists that will include database decision making and how to look at progress monitoring data and screening data. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And MT, the MTSS work is on the we're one of 19 federally funded comprehensive centers. So that pocket, that bucket of money has been spent working with MDE on developing and implementing the MTSS framework, which is the overarching framework that literacy sits within. So I think we've got it covered and we have to do coaching on the MTSS side too. So great. Okay, great. So let's let's segue into another topic, which is what happens when we find students who are not reading at grade levels. So on that screener, we find students who are not reading at grade level. What does the what can parents expect? Um, what what can they expect from schools to do when they run that screener and they find that students are not at grade level in wherever? Where well, first going? of all, just and then I'll let these students. But in statute, we put that it, intervention. Yep. Should so follow. let's talk about that. What so that I'll let like? yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does that look like? And by the way, that that was not there before. I mean, five hundred four IEP, like right, folks. You were advocating to try to like knocking on the door, like my kid needs help, and that wasn't there. So yeah. go ahead, you guys. I'll stop that. Well, the law requires intervention yeah. for mm -hmm. students that are reading mm -hmm. right. below grade level. Um, and so some of the, one of the things after the, the next list comes out of curriculum on January 1st, I have to tell you, I'm grateful that the legislature didn't attach timelines to everything in there. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, we had a timetable and I was like, I know. Is this right? You guys look at this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So once we get through the curriculum, we will then start um, looking at vetting intervention materials and looking not only for interventions um, that are obviously aligned with the research, but we got to look at interventions that have high effect sizes, because when you have kids that are a year or more below grade level, our goal is to accelerate learning. And so there are some kids that are going to have to make more than a year's worth of growth in a year's time. And the way that we're going to do that is by um, identifying interventions with high effect sizes and training the teachers on how to use the interventions and collecting fidelity of implementation data to make sure that kids are getting the required dosage and that we're adhering to the intervention and collect progress monitoring data weekly or bi-weekly so that we can know right away if a student isn't making good progress. There's no need to wait till the end of the year till an MCA test is given, you can, we can figure this out in a matter of weeks if kids aren't making good progress, then it's not give up, it's try something different and go back and uh, look at what, at the, the underlying skill deficits, maybe pick the wrong one to start with, but we're gonna just keep going through that cycle until we find something that works. And I'm, I've seen it done, I've seen graphs with, five different intervention lines drawn when kids aren't making progress. And I've seen kids after changing things up four or five times, they reach grade level target. It can be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And I, just following up on that, one of the things that's special about the READ Act is that we're not just talking about kids in elementary school, we're talking about kids in middle and high school as mm -hmm. well. We have kids who, right? Who are all the way up to 12th grade. grade. Yep. 12th yep. grade. Um, and so, I, I just want to state for the people in the room that part of what you will list on your list of recommended is what would be effective for kids in eighth grade. Yep. Tenth grade. Yep. We're going to have to plot, you know, it, it'll, it's going to take some time to identify all of that, but <laughs> we're going to start and it might kind of roll out in phases. We'll have to, uh, we, we haven't. You see why it's a two-year contract with Carrie, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Lots of work to do. Yeah. Um, lots yeah. of work to do. Okay. Let's move to professional development. So this is teacher professional development. And at the beginning, at the beginning of this, we said there are the state law required, three act required three, right? At least three, and we got three. Mm -hmm. So at least three, we got three. Carrie, core, and letters. So there's a couple of maybe these are just we'll slip through these too, right? First question: Which teachers? need to complete this training. 
all teachers, some teachers, couple of teachers, which teachers? I don't have the law in front of me. I think it's what is it, K for three, and then K for three, we had, of course, special education teachers, curriculum directors, um, then anybody that is doing, providing support for reading instruction, um, employees who select literacy instruction materials. We did that because sometimes it's not a curriculum director. Sometimes it's like a curriculum associate. And so we need to make sure that we were all encompassing. I don't think you guys understand. We worked on this nonstop. Like Bobby and I, she was like, stop calling me <laughs> at 10 o'clock at night to talk about this. Or Kim. How many, how many versions of the Read Act do you think there were? There was, what were they, Bobby? At least a dozen. Oh, oh more dozen. than that. It was like 28. Yeah, yeah. like 28 These versions. Right. Yeah. Know, but I had COVID for three weeks during the event. I, was talking, I was on the phone talking. Oh, yeah. my COVID she also days. couldn't shake. <laughs> we were all talking to each other a lot because there we wanted to, we were talking to curriculum um, directors in schools. Um, but yes, pre K for three teachers. Um, we're trying to get the you know the main classroom teachers and special education teachers first, and then we added in like principals and and things like that because some of the stuff like you know it was like the dyslexic people, and you were like what the the fly guy. Um, <laughs> so he was we want him trained too, right? Because like we, we just we shouldn't have to have those dismissive conversations. And so ideally, you know, we we get everybody. Okay, great. So second, do the, the three that I listed. Second question, are these the only training programs that just continues to meet that requirement? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So could schools use their own employee and say, hey, you know, we have a better, yeah. no. Yeah. Not if they're a public school or a charter yeah. school. Yeah. All right, that's great, okay. Um, this is a harder question. So the letters, Bobby talked about this, I think, in the, you know, so two sessions ago, we, we started a grant program for letters. Those were all voluntary teachers, teachers who said, I raised their hand and said, I want to take letters and they filled, filled up that class, right? It's popular, but those were voluntary teachers. We've gotten doing that now. This is a mandatory requirement for the teachers that Representative Ellison listed. Um, and when you do something like that, sometimes you're going to have people who say, I'll do it because I have to. I'll take that training because I have to, but I'm not a believer. What things can we all do collectively in this room? What can you do um, to help bring some of those? We know, hopefully it's not that many, but we know that there will be stragglers. Bobby, we do ours. Well, it's all about the level of support they feel mm -hmm. and the level of support they feel from their building leaders. So it's really getting the building leadership on board to provide the level of support that the teachers are going to need. I just was in an elementary school building on Friday and this we talked a lot about the READ Act because elementary teachers not only have the READ Act, they have a new set of standards coming down the road for like the next six years. So we really have to be um, aware of the the what what is being expected of the elementary school teachers that being said you know we do have built-in supports like the regional literacy networks the metro area in the seven county area will have a regional literacy network that is staffed with highly qualified and trained literacy coaches to support these school-based leadership teams and each district will be hiring a literacy lead and so our job is to make sure these literacy leads are trained and have the, the background and the experience and the, the knowledge base in the science of reading to really be a district leader to implement the READ Act district-wide. So it's kind of a tiered level of support that, you know, fortunately the READ Act has funding to support. And so, you know, we haven't got it all planned out yet. Like the regional literacy networks, you know, we're still working on contracts and, and getting those up and running, but we really feel that through the three training options and through the work of the regional literacy networks that, you know, the reason we didn't want more than three training trainings offered because, you know, we have a, a system, we will have a system in place that really supports those concentrated efforts around what those trainings are. We want a district to choose one of those three. We don't want a district, one building doing this, one building doing that. We want a district that chooses one 
so that regional literacy network can focus in on the support for that district around what training they need. Kim mentioned the coaching training. You know, we know that district coaches, district leaders in the regional literacy network coaches are going to need ongoing supports, coaching, and to help them help the school districts with the fidelity and implementation of the READ Act. So these pieces are in progress and, and people are being hired. And, and one of your questions was around, you know, each of these trainings has a asynchronous and a synchronous component. That was one of our requirements. So we've been asked a lot if district folks or service cooperative folks can be those facilitators in those synchronous trainings because they've gone through the training. Well, going through the training and being able to lead and coach a staff in the implementation of these practices are two different things. So mm -hmm. we are really going to ensure that whoever these facilitators are in districts or in service cooperatives have that high quality training and coaching prior to, to being approved to service facilitator. Doesn't that just make you so happy yes. when she just said yeah. Like you just like, it feels really good. Feels good. And yeah. I would just like to say one little thing too, is like one of the things that we learned throughout the process of, of and you guys can both back me up on this is, and um, is that, you know, the teachers are not villains. The ones that were taught in whole language and balanced letters, they're mm -hmm. not, they're, 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 as a therapist, I'll tell you, if somebody said, I went to the University of Minnesota too, and they said, you know, I'm going to teach you in the ways of cognitive behavioral therapy. And I'm like, yes, I, I, that's what I do. Right. But then 20 years later or 30 years later, somebody's like, you are harming my child by doing that. Like, imagine that, imagine being that person. And so, yes, we had people come testify at the Capitol. Um, and still like on my Facebook page, somebody is like, you know, there's, um, there's a guy who's mad at me, he's a professor and, and I get it. And so I don't want to villainize that the blame and shame is just with parents and kids, just like the teacher, right? It's, we were really successful because we said, we're not doing that at all. This has been a hard situation. We can't blame or shame anyone. Let's let's be let's solve this problem together. Yeah. I have to say too, the vast majority of educators, and I'm in schools three or four times a week here in Minnesota and nationally, they're excited. They're a lot of them are it's about time. Like, and yeah, I'm working with one district outside of the state that has actually been sued by a, a, a parents of students with dyslexia for not teaching their child to read. And I'm working with that district. And, you know, it's, uh, it's taking some time, but as they really unpack it, and you work with them, and you show them the curriculum, and then you, you have them dig in and look to see all of these different components, instead of just saying, oh, that curriculum was reviewed, and it's not sufficient. I've been working with the teachers to get in and look at it and give them tools to evaluate it. And they're coming along, they're, they get it. But it's sometimes when you've been doing something that long, it's the only thing you ever taught that you were ever taught and that you ever know. You don't know until you know better and you have to see for yourself where some of these curricula really fall short, short with systematic and explicit instruction. So I have a lot of hope and optimism. I I much more positivity um, I've experienced than resistance. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's a great segue to our last topic, which is curriculum, which by far and away, when people ask me questions, that's the that's the part that's hardest for people to understand. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's talk about what that what that is. So the READ Act requires MDE and CARI to identify five, at least five, evidence-based literacy curriculum, and that will be by January 1st, 2024. But and this is the part that I just want to make sure we talk about. Districts are not required to use that list. They're not required to pick from that list and just absolutely change. Required to use an evidence-based They are, right? So here's where this is where this gets fun, right? Yep. They don't have to use from that list but they do have to use an evidence-based curriculum. So that maybe sounds like that's right for some disagreement, potentially, right? Like I think we can see where that maybe is, is gonna be an issue. So 
Um, let's, because I want to make sure we leave time for some questions. Um, let's just talk about who gets to decide what an evidence-based curriculum is, right? You're going to make a list of five and a district picks a different one. As a parent, you say, this is the, you know, we're not going to call them out. I could, but I'm not going to. Um, they're using this curriculum and, and you disagree. You say, I don't think that's an evidence-based curriculum, but the district, but a district says it is. How, what is your advice or your process of how people can come to an agreement about that? What are your thoughts on that? And that's hard, I think. Well, so I like let's just set the stage on this because you're like, why did you do that? That's right? I know, I know. Well, welcome to lawmaking, you guys. It's, there's two. You know how many how many are so at the Capitol? Two hundred and one of us. So you see how I'm like very outspoken and maybe a little pushy. It's on purpose. It's by design because I have to be in order to get anything done. And and I will say is you know the five we said evidence based. Now if you look at evidence based, it's very clearly. You know, it, it it very much lays out the five pillars of literacy. Sorry, so. It is very clear that it, it has to be something that is essentially science of reading, and so or structural literacy. So um, we did make that very clear. We said that here are going to be the five, and they do not get any curriculum dollars unless it is one of those five. Not at all. And then remember, I told you about that twenty twenty five report to the legislature, and they're going to be everybody screening. So we're going to have this report and we're going to be like, hey, what's going on? How are you doing? All the teachers have to be trained. The curriculum has to be essentially following these components. But if it doesn't, it will be reported on that local literacy plan, which will be aggregated into the data that the legislature will see, that you will see. And then you'll say, wait, how come our scores are not as great as you dying on whatever represent? Um, we, we switched early. Um, but like, because we're seeing great number turn right? We're on our, I think, third year and we are doing three, three screeners. But um, so we'll, you'll be able to see that. Now, will you be able to force your district to change? Listen, I would love a world where we could do all of the things absolutely we want to, but that's just, unfortunately, we're a big state and it was really hard. So I, we got us to like the, you know, I don't, not a big football person, but like, you yeah. know, where, where are you when you're almost at touchdown? Complete touchdown. What is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're at the ten year line. I mean, that's essentially we got to leave a little bit to districts. And that I mean, under I'm you know understanding that we just can't get everything that we want in this bill. The hope would be though that as more teachers are trained and more curriculum directors yeah. are trained, that better decisions are made. Right? Is that mm -hmm. that's a more long term game, right? Mm -hmm. That's. So Which is why we want the, you know, the superintendents and the principals uh, trained with yeah. the professional development money as well. Yeah. But I mean, what Kiri is going to be doing and the work they're going to be doing, setting it all out, really being able to have that. It's, it's, you get curriculum money. Why would you not want to take it? So you also get somebody that's going to vet it out. I had one publisher call me um, and <laughs> say, yeah, I think yeah, I've yeah. a lot of <laughs> One publisher called me and he's like, you, you, like, what if we're not picked? you've set this up districts won't buy my stuff right now and i'm like well like it's like minnesota's taking a pause right now and i think a lot of districts want to do the right thing so i don't i don't think we want to underestimate districts they want their kids to succeed i mean that's that's what they're all there for it's not like there's like you know millions of dollars in education and all of a sudden the, you know the the superintendent's like i mean gonna profit off of not getting the best materials to kids he, they're going to all want to make sure that they're seeing what Carrie's providing us. I mean, it's a great thing that we have done here. Yeah. Do you think, so speaking of that, where you say there's money, right? So we're, the Read Act has a lot of money represented outside. Not enough. I think we're going to need more. Right. So yeah. that's, that was a question, right? Do we feel like we have enough money allocated for? No. 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 Well, the reimbursement process alone, I mean, even the fact that from, you could be reimbursed from 2021, I mean, that could eat up. The money there so we are still working with finance on on an equitable reimbursement process more than likely will not be a hundred percent of because then you've got huge districts that so that's that's a little more complicated than but we're working with our finance finance folks um, and the curriculum money almost got cut i would yeah. we were fighting for it up here the, the training money we'll see you know we're, we're we're trying to figure out a way to 
we're going to put on the week of the 23rd, each vendor is going to do an introductory webinar on their training. And then we are trying to figure out how to get districts to send us information about who they're anticipating choosing. So we know the amount of money. I mean, because I can't leave a contract open-ended. So it has to be up to a certain amount of money because we don't know which district is going to choose which training. Mm -hmm. And letters is about three times as much as carry all in, in core learning. It, rightly so, it, it's 18 months. So anyway, there's a lot of um, technical administrative things, but no, there's not, I mean, I, we're anticipating the training might be on target, but certainly not the curriculum. No. Um, well, I guess the good news is Representative us and has one more right there. It's like dollars, right? right? It's Friday. That's yeah. going to segue into my last question, and then we're going to go to audience questions, and this is going straight to you. So what are the unfinished business items for education at the Capitol? Do you see, and I'll feed you one and see if you want to, but is there a place to have something that addresses some of the things that higher education could do better? We addressed higher ed in this bill. I mean, it was like we'll a, like a, so we essentially said in higher ed that you cannot, you have to teach structured literacy to your teacher candidates. It was like football again. It was like the Hail Mary at the end. Yeah, I used that right, I think, right? Then I did. Okay, good. So yeah, we did that at the end. So we were not going to go there. But then we were like, you know what, forget it. We're going to do it. I mean, this is like, we're lawmakers. And I really credit uh, Senator B. Quaid for that one. She was like, Heather, we're doing this. And I was like, are you sure they're going to be so mad? So we did. And we talked to the, you know, talked to the committee. We we're like highlighting it. And folks, let us do it. I mean, when lawmakers are like, I have very little power, don't listen to them. That's not true. Like we, that was a big change. That was a big change that our districts have to do or not districts, excuse me, our higher education institutes have to do. And I think, you know, professors um, that will be coming. Let me go out of the way. So higher ed, I mean, maybe it's some, it might be some good uh, grants for doing some of the education, but I mean, I don't know that they need it. Universities, you usually have a budget, don't you? For, for professors doing some like silly I, stuff. I'm a soft money research center, which oh, I got yeah. a break. I got a break in the money yeah, and stay afloat. Yeah, so, well, I think they do, but, but I mean, they, yeah. I mean, and hearing some revelings about the need of a early read act for early, early childhood. childhood. Early childhood. I don't know. Yeah. We have some audience questions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a good idea. We could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People want to do a math act. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm going to be here for that one, but it sounds good. There is a science of math. Oh, no, I like it. Yes. All right. So some questions from the audience. Um, somebody is wondering about, do the five curriculum choices work for a Spanish immersion school? That keeps being asked. Um, and that's on our list to tackle because the Spanish immersion schools don't usually teach English reading in the middle fourth or fifth grade. Yeah. Hmm. But I don't think we have any answer to that right now. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a popular question, though. Yeah. It's been. Yes. I work in a school with the Spanish immersion program. It is a hot topic, too. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of questions about middle and high school. Mm -hmm. Somebody said their concern is about all of those children, grade four and above, who are not reading at grade level. What will that look like? So what that will look like, right? Uh, as so as the screeners are implemented, those screen the children that are are screened, um, that are not reading at. So if, if you're if you have a concern that your child is fourth grade and above, um, and they're not reading at, you think they're not reading at grade level. There's ways for and districts should have these screeners right now. And if they don't, yeah, most of them do. Almost, I mean, yeah, I haven't really seen a school that doesn't have. So you're you're able to have your child screen. Oh, you do. You, the look on your face means like you've seen a school with no screener. No, screeners. Oh, okay. Well, then they haven't switched over yet. Okay. Well, that's good. I was like, oh my gosh. I'm oh, sorry. Just, like, I'm really good at reading faces. Um, okay. So uh, that you'll have that, and then you'll be able to see whether or not you know you should be. It should be easier for parents. The read act should be to have your child screened and to know whether or not they need intervention. Right. Yeah. yeah. And there's like through the MTSS framework, we work a lot with helping building principals schedule interventions, and one of the 
more efficient models is it's oftentimes called what I need time, but it's an intervention block of 45 minutes to an hour where all kids can get help, including kids that are have not reached grade level proficiency standards to kids that maybe are exceeding but aren't making enough growth. And there's a way to concentrate your resources at, in the building at that grade level so that all of the kids can get the help that they need. And there, that's just one example of a, of a scheduling system. But the largest thing that I've, the last book I wrote was about universal instruction, that instruction that all kids get, tier one. And we're working with districts that, you know, might only have 40% of kids proficient at tier one, which means 60% need intervention. So do you really funnel intervention to 60% of the kids? You know, you work on getting your universal instruction stronger, which is what mm -hmm. getting a good curriculum in with assessments and teachers looking at data. So it's like a lot of synergy happening here. That what it's like to think about uh, Singapore when we switched over our district switch, switched over to a Singapore math method. It would they would break up students based on ability. It's like why are why don't we do that versus like we need more interventionalists in some of those situations. To your point, it's like break up into yeah, and you can push interventions into the classroom. Yeah, I saw that last week. It was really that, that was, was great. what we yeah. did at the St. Croix River Education District in 1997. What yeah. I've seen, like eight, my sons have, they're in eighth grade. They do Hill Rap as a group, right? I mean, it, it's working great. And they still get private tutoring as well, but hopefully not everybody can afford this. So hopefully this will be successful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, next question is, are schools required to tell parents if their child shows signs of dyslexia from the screening? We'll say that one more time. Are schools required to tell parents if their child shows signs of dyslexia based on the screener? Yes, yeah, there's a notification piece. Mm -hmm. um, what can be done about, I would pause on that one, sorry. Um, what about online schools, charter schools? In my experience with online schools, it has been no response for intervention. Online schools are the only way our public schools. So, right. Yeah. So that that's we haven't thought about online schools around the intervention piece. And I would need to talk to that team at MDE. I'm sure that they're they they had an online school right. scrap and sure. sort of figured it out. Yeah, hell, we did it they, during the pandemic. Yeah, you right. could do interventions online. Just, yeah. yeah, or some of the online schools. Okay, yeah. yeah. interventions. Yeah, they should. They should be. If it's a charter, yeah, charter they should be offered interventions. Right. They are a public school. I know we think of charter schools as like they're a public school, so mm -hmm. they should be offering interventions. So if they're not. You let this nice lady over here know we're empty. Yeah. Or you can email me and I'll be like, what are you doing? Uh, the next question is one I personally appreciate. Letters is a huge time commitment. As a teacher, I'm concerned about the workload. If you have teachers already working 50 to 60 hours plus a week, how can that be manageable? Well, that's why two of the options on the list um, here is, here is one, it was written into statute that we can be one of the providers and um, I have a number of people on staff that have gone through letters, their letters trainers. It's good, it's intensive, but the, the, the carry all, which stands for advancing language and literacy is gonna come in around the 50 hour mark. So it's not gonna be as intensive. 50 hours is still a lot of training. Um, so, and the other one that was identified core, uh, core is also, it might be 60 hours, 45, 50, 45, but then they both have the, the synchronous sessions. So, I mean, I guess I would think about like districts that, you know, training your literacy specialists that you really want to go deep with, with an intensive training and, um, but not, not all, all teachers need that level of intensity. Mm -hmm. And you know, school districts are asking really good questions around how do I find the time? How do I build this training into our PD days? And they're looking, you know, PD days are are gone. I mean, so they're looking at next August and how to build this training in for those days next August. So, because there's time between now and 
July 1 of 24 to, to get this training in. Um, we're encouraging, you know, districts now are required to use their literacy incentive aid funds for these comprehensive literacy reform efforts. Well, substitute teachers, stipends for teachers to potentially take training on their own time if that's the only way to do it. So we are collecting these stories and these questions and hope to get some strategies out to district leaders around, well, here's how this district's doing it. And here's how this, so just some different ideas of how this time might be covered or PD day times or early release or so, but they're thinking about it and, and being very creative. So we just, it's our job to collect those stories and get it out for others to take advantage of. Great, thank you. And you said the REDAC does have um, stipends for teacher for professional development. No, the, does that make it in so, to do? So the literacy incentive for, aid can be used for teacher mm -hmm, stipends. Mm -hmm. to yeah. We didn't have enough. We didn't have enough money. I mean, there's things that they, you you start with. I mean, I, literally, and we were like, oh, hundred thousand. Uh, or sorry, hundred million. It's like nothing at <laughs> <in> the capital. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it's uh, but we we are down to ninety million over four years. I have some online questions if you want. Okay, go ahead. Um, a few questions around if you can expand on how Dibbles and FastBridge met the criteria um, compared to other things like AmesWeb. Yeah, and we, Star. We had a comprehensive rubric that we used where we were looking at the psychometric characteristics. So we would look at the validity of each measure, the reliability the norm sample that was used to validate the measures. Um, I think we did determine early on that we didn't want a computer adaptive measure for screening um, so that it would that it would be a, you know a face-to-face -face administration. Um, we looked at the diagnostic accuracy. So you want a measure to in a good day, you want a measure to tell you, who are the kids that really don't need help? You want the, the, the screening measure to identify who doesn't need help, and you want it to identify the kids that actually do need help. And there's statistical terms that are used. It's called specificity and sensitivity. And so we, those of us that are really into data, pour over those manuals at night to go through and look at all the different measures and figure out um, which ones are have the best psychometric rigor. And so there was a rubric developed and it was used and we picked um, we picked the two that that had very good technical adequacy. And it's kind of like with professional learning, you don't want a ton of measures mm -hmm. because it's even if dibble, dibbles and fastbridge have an oral reading fluency measure, where you count the number of words right correct in a minute. But you can't just say, oh, they both have the same measure. We're going to put them in the same data set because they're different passages. So that's where there's some work that needs to happen to determine some statistical equivalency between the new measure, the both measures, so that we can we can make those types of decisions. So we landed with two. Um, and landed with two, and there's there's one that is submitting some additional information. Um, and if that comes back, um, that could likely be on the list. And we have to, we have to, that. I mean, I think that we have to be careful yeah. though with not having more than two. I mean, it wasn't, that was more coming from the, the state of just looking at that aggregation of data and saying, how are we going to be able to look at all these different districts and know what's happening? Because part of the problem that we were seeing, and I think, you know, I, we can't forget that there's, you know, of course, there's. I'm, I'm good to hear that there's another company that wants to be considered. I get it. But the reality is, is we have to be able to like, we didn't have one large data ability for parents, for lawmakers, for the Department of Education to look and say, what's going on in the state of Minnesota with our literacy? Who's using what curriculum? How are kids? Not all kids take MCAs. I, in fact, do not have my kids take the MCAs because they do have pretty severe dyslexia. And I'm like, this is a waste of your time 
and it makes it stressful for you, it doesn't help you by any means. It's, it's, it's administered at the end of the school year. It's not like, oh, you know what? Let's take this and help you right when you come back to school with all these little, that's not done. That is not done at all. So I think, yes, companies are going to want to say, consider me, put me on the list. But the reality is, is, is we have to make sure that we're putting our kids first versus another company coming in saying, consider me. Yeah, well, listen, this is, we are considering our kids and they have been in the back of the bus for way too long. So I, I want to hear more about that. I, I don't know about adding another person. So <laughs> we, might, we might be, when we might be good back at the Capitol, like, I don't think so. So we'll see Okay, we're trying to wrap by 745. I have one question that will take a little length, but one quick one. When will training for literacy leads be available? Do we have a date for that? That was not established okay. as a timeline. Should but, be determined. But we talk, we're talking about getting that. Okay. But it, it has the to other... be done by 2027. Right. So, so right. we have to, all of this will be done by 2027. So within that time. Okay. The little longer question, which has come up in various forms, is I have a third grader, I have a fifth grader, I have someone who qualifies right now for an IEP and help and we're not getting it. And what do we, the older grades aren't quite addressed in this REDAC as intensely as the young they are addressed. The older grades are addressed. They're, it, right, the yes. teacher training though, the, the teachers who need the training where yeah. it's above grade level, the intervention kind of in right. down the road sometime. So what about the kids who aren't getting the services they need, even if they're lower grades right now? What can you tell those families? <laughs> The Read Act, it, it does say that those 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 lower grades and those higher grades should be getting intervention. I would say to work with your district. Again, I cannot stress that we have to give each other grace in this process. I think everybody wants results right away. We are planting sometimes trees in this instance that we will not always get the shade of. And I think um, that is hard. But I would say continue to work with your district. The Read Act, and if she or he or she, whoever's on the, the computer wants to reach out to me, it's rep.heather.edelson at house.mn.gov. I know it's really long, but email me. Uh, happy to work with you if there's a specific district, if they're having problems. I am a huge disability advocate as well. So if you're having problems, I'm happy to see if I can help. But they should be. They should be already. That's in state law that you should be able to get intervention. Great, thank you. All right, well, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Thank you to Representative Edelson, Dr. Gibbons, and Bob Burnham for being here. Thank you. Thank you.